Let me share with us a little word of encouragement from a viewer of our online broadcast this morning. Sometimes you wonder if it's beneficial, if it's reaching anybody, if it's helping. We don't see that unseen audience out there. Uh, this is one, if I were to call his name, most all of us would recognize the name. He said, I really enjoyed your message in Revelation chapter 2 this morning. I wish there was a way to make, <laughs> to make mandatory all ministers of Christ's gospel to be compelled to watch your message from God's word today. <laughs> I know the ministry, and he calls the name of a church, would be offended if I were to ask him to listen to your message like the one you delivered this morning. What a shame. And he goes on to talk about some of the events there at that particular church and how there needs to be gospel preaching. And so I'm thankful for those words of encouragement. Pray also for the family that was visiting with us this morning. Uh, I find that they are the young age that we fall, most of us, many of us fall into the category of. Uh, it's the, uh, what do they call it? Uh, the, uh, uh, in some churches they call them the, uh, anyway, they've, there's a name. It's not, we're not called seniors most of the time, and that's good. Uh, but they're in that category, and uh, he has a background as an engineer. She heads up the Filipino Republican Party for Duval County. And a uh, very interesting couple. I discovered that I knew him uh, through a third party uh, in years gone by as an engineer in some of the work that he had done. So I'm thankful that they were here. But another positive note that would be an encouragement to you. She stood this morning and she was extremely complimentary of the message and the time of worship with us. And I'm always thankful to hear that. And uh, she said, this is what is needed is this kind of preaching. She said, the problem is most churches are not doing this. And she said, it's obvious, though, that most Christians are really not looking for it. It's obvious with the number. And I said, that's exactly right. When you preach the truth of the gospel, even though most Christians say, I want to hear the word of God, I want to know God's word, they're simply not understanding what is the truth of the gospel and what God's word is really about. So pray for that couple. Uh, continue to pray for those that are watching that are tuning in even now with us for the evening broadcast. And I'm thankful for your presence with us, even though you're unseen in the walls of the sanctuary here. You're invited to come and to worship with us in a worship service on campus with us at any time. We're delighted to have you. Open your Bibles to John the 14th chapter. John chapter 14. There's one very simple verse though it is a profound verse that I want to read for us that is our basic text for the message. And while you're turning to John chapter 14 and verse 27, John 14, 27, let me say a few words by way of introduction. We hear the word peace often. Uh, in fact, with most of our candidates from both sides of the aisle, they talk about the need to bring about international, global peace. There is a sense out of Israel that uh, there is a seeking of peace. since the formation of Israel, May the 15th, 1948. They have sought to find peace. It's very elusive. I talked with a gentleman just this afternoon. He said uh, uh, that he'd been saved for six years. He and his wife both got saved six years ago. He is in business for himself for the past year and a half. And he said, uh, I don't understand it, Pastor. He said, everything that you could think of has gone wrong in the past year and a half. We didn't have those problems six years ago before we got saved. I said, it's Satan's design to tear down and destroy and to prevent peace in the hearts and the lives of the child of God. The need for world peace, the need for national peace, the need for ethnic peace. Uh, but the question is, is it possible? May I suggest that we're looking for peace in the wrong place. We're looking for the right thing 
in the wrong place. A number of years ago, had a man and his wife, and uh, I believe that it was two children, and they had uh, he had them in the academy with us. He was a recruiter for the Army. He had moved up from uh, Gainesville and was here about uh, three or four years and then was transferred again, which is typical of military. But um, on uh, the occasion of coming to be with us and placing their membership here, on one uh, opportunity for sharing testimony, he said, uh, "We his words, he said, we've been in this city for uh, two, two and a half years. He said, we've been to all of the big churches. We've been to all of the intermediate churches. He said, we were looking for the gospel being proclaimed verse by verse, chapter by chapter in the scripture so that we could learn the word of God. He said, but what we've been doing is looking for the right thing in the wrong places. He said, not until we came here have we heard the scripture being expounded and exposed and unfolded for our understanding. And he said it brings a great joy and peace to be able to worship where the word of God is being proclaimed. What is real peace? How do we find it? Let me give you a definition because the Lord Jesus Christ says in verse 27 of John 14, he says, peace I leave with you. We'll read that verse in a moment. But peace is a state of con concord or tranquility, freedom from disquieting or offensive thoughts or emotions, end quote. Let me read that again. It is a state of concord or tranquility, freedom from disquieting or oppressive thoughts or emotions. Now, if you've driven in Jacksonville very many times, you find that it's not a peaceful thing to drive, to drive on the 295 Beltway or any other major expressway in our city. It's not an easy thing to live the Christian life and to be in a state of concord and tranquility and to be free from disquieting oppressive thoughts or emotions. But it is possible through the Lord Jesus Christ. Stand, if you will, please. As we read together, and I'll read audibly, follow with me in your scriptures silently. John chapter 14, verse 27. Jesus is talking about leaving his disciples, and he's already told them that he's going to leave them with a comforter. They're not going to be without a comforter. And the comforter is going to teach them, teach us all things, he says in verse 26. But in verse 27, which is the key verse for our message, Jesus says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Thank you, and we may be seated. Two things that I want to bring to our attention briefly in these brief moments together as we study the thought, Jesus says, peace I leave with you. What is peace? What is the source of peace? What is the serenity or the security of peace? I want us to notice two things, the source of peace recorded, and secondly, the security of peace reviewed. The source of peace recorded and the security of peace reviewed. Notice, first of all, the source of peace. Number one, it is supernatural. It is supernatural. It is not something that we can conjure up ourselves. It is not something that we can decide that I'm going to have a peaceful day and we're going to make it be a peaceful day or a peaceful occasion. Jesus says, peace I leave with you. It is supernatural. It comes from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. We can be in the midst of a storm. We can be in the midst of a problem. We can be in the midst of difficulty and still find that inner peace that only the Lord Jesus Christ can provide. It is the Lord Jesus Christ that promises to give us peace. Peace I leave with you. Now, if we're not so, if we're not possible, then why would the Lord Jesus Christ have said that? In fact, we can back up to John chapter 14 and verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in me, believe also in God. Notice, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If we're not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. 
The key to the peace from the Lord Jesus Christ is to place our trust and our confidence totally in him. If our trust and our confidence and our hopes built on anything less than Jesus Christ, it's vacuous, it's void, it's null, and has no value in our lives as, to, as pertaining to peace. There's no such thing. Some have the sense of being, and by the way, listen, I'm preaching this to me and you. Some of us have the sense that, uh, you know, somehow, some way, uh, there seems to be no way to get to that elusiveness of real tranquility and real peace. There is a misunderstanding, I believe, for the most part in the lives of most of us as believers as to what real peace is about. It's not a matter of facing a crisis or a difficulty with a sense of urgency and a sense of concern. That's not what we're talking about. That peace is where we have that inner tranquility and that inner concord and that freedom from that disquieting, oppressive thoughts or emotions. It's where inside we are stable and still, and the only way that is possible is to place our trust and our hope and our confidence in Jesus Christ, nothing more nothing less. Now, does that mean there won't be problems? No. Does that mean there won't be difficulties? No. Does that mean that we'll not face uh, sometimes dark, uh, deep, watered days? No. But in the midst of the flood, in the midst of the fire, in the midst of the problem, we can have that peace that passes all understanding according to the Scripture. We're talking about the source of peace recorded. Not only it's supernatural, but it is special. It is special. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. It's not a world's peace. It is not peace that's found in the bottle or in pills or in some uh, psychologist that says, well, if you just think good thoughts and you repeat this 15 times a day, and if you do this and try to modify your thinking and modify your life and modify what you do, then somehow, some way, we'll have peace. No, no, no. That's not it at all. It is supernatural and it's special because Jesus Christ himself is speaking and he says it's not the kind of peace that the world gives you. The kind of peace that I give you is supernatural and it's from me, Jesus speaking as he says that. It is a special kind of peace. I don't know about you, but I enjoy that peace that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. My bride can tell you, and this does not mean that I go continually and there's always 100% of the time peace. But my bride can tell you sometimes in very difficult uh, times and days and circumstances, uh, she says, and I don't say this to put her on the spot, she said, I don't see how you keep on going. And I say, uh, you know, I don't either, but it's something that's within me. It's something that God is doing that I don't fully understand that gives the strength and the tenacity and the peace to keep on keeping on even when it seems impossible with some of the things that God's called upon us to do. It is supernatural and it's special. It is the peace from the Lord Jesus Christ. It is also stabilizing, stabilizing. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Troubled, notice there, and afraid. Trouble and fear. Trouble and fear, difficulties that we face, causes us to be fearful because we do not know what the circumstance and the situation will uh, inure to and how it could be to our detriment and difficulty. As a result of that, we are troubled by things that we don't understand. We're troubled by things that we cannot fathom. And as a result of that, we are fearful of the circumstances and the situation. I tell people in a half-joking but yet very serious manner, I get, every, get up every morning, I pray, ask God for wisdom and direction, and then go through the day acting like I've good, got good sense. Nobody knows the difference. <laughs> it's a matter of placing our trust and our confidence in Jesus Christ, nothing else, nothing more, nothing less. Let not your heart be troubled. That is, don't let it destabilize you. Don't let the trouble be the difficulty that causes you to get off track. And uh, let not your heart be afraid. Trouble and fear. 
In fact, if you look at the world scenario today, you look at what's taking place in society as we speak, you look at what is taking place with the morals and the ethics and the values and the political machine and the destabilization of our currents and our funds on a national and international global basis, you can sit back and look at it and say, what's the use? Why should I get up and just go into a cocoon and do nothing as far as God would have us to do? There are multitudes today that have simply become so fearful and so troubled and so frightened that they do not do anything. There are those that because of the difficulties that they face, the man, and perhaps you've heard me tell the story, his name was Al, and Al was a greenskeeper with one of the major golf courses here in the city, and Al had gotten saved, and then his wife both serving the Lord here in the church, and he shared how so often as he would take his lunchbox to work and he'd have his Bible in his lunchbox, he would sit down wherever he's working on the greens, and the other greenskeepers with him, and they'd sit and they'd talk. He'd open his lunchbox and read his Bible and have the blessing, and then eat his uh, lunch, eat his sandwiches, and he said the co-workers would make fun of him and beguile him and ridicule him about depending on the Bible and how the Bible is just a bunch of myth and it has no real value. And he said, he on one occasion he told me, he said, Pastor, I got so tired and so weary with being made fun of and ridiculed. He said, I just stopped reading my Bible. I stopped praying. I stopped taking my Bible in my lunchbox. And he said, I found I had no difficulty. Satan just seemingly left me alone. Everything was okay. He said, but I realized what was taking place. Satan was pleased with it when I'm not studying the Bible, not reading the Scripture, not praying, and not doing my devotion. He said, so I made the decision that regardless of what they say, regardless of what the world says, regardless of what others say, I'm going to keep on serving the Lord Jesus Christ, studying the Word, reading the Word, and praying, and being obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Satan has a way of destabilizing our peace. Satan has a way of undermining our tranquility. Satan has a way of causing us to be fearful of what we do not know. You see, there's not a human being on the globe that can tell you what tomorrow will be like. We can sit back and be worried and anxious and fearful of the tomorrows because of the situation on a global basis, a national basis, and on a local basis with every aspect of life. We can sit back and worry about that and fret over that until the point that we have no peace and tranquility in our hearts at all. It's supernatural. It is stabilizing. In fact, in John chapter 16 and verse 33, the scripture says this, Jesus speaking, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, that's the word thalipsis, pressure, problems, pain, difficulty, suffering, and pressures. Notice the scripture says in John 16, 33, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. It's because Jesus Christ is the one that provides the peace and it's the Lord Jesus Christ that has overcome the world. Listen very carefully. That little problem that you have or that I have that we are faced with yesterday, today, or tomorrow, Jesus Christ has already overcome that problem. Whatever it is, whatever the breadth and the depth of it may be, he has already conquered it. Even the conquering of death. So therefore we should have peace we should have peace and realize that the peace comes not from the world, but from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Peace I leave with you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Romans, the first of the fifth chapter and the first verse. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through Dia, that's the access, the avenue, our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible is filled with references for the child of God to have peace. And in every case we find that peace comes none other than from the Lord Jesus Christ and having a relationship with him, knowing him as Savior and as Lord. I tell everybody everywhere all the time, if there's doubt about your salvation, don't go with that distraught condition of being uncertain and unsettled have that peace that passes all understanding by saying yes where there's doubt do where there's a doubt about a relationship to Jesus Christ say yes to him as Savior and as Lord not only the source of peace recorded but the security of peace reviewed notice first of all the supply 
I read the verse a moment ago. Let's look at it again. Romans 5, 1, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Man is at enmity with God. Man in his natural state is at war with God. Man in his natural state is without peace until we say yes to Jesus Christ. It is Jesus Christ that provides us with the peace. And that Romans 5 verse 1, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the doorway to peace. Without Jesus Christ, there is no peace. Without Jesus Christ, it's an impossibility to hope for, to plan for, to strive for, to try to acquire or to get or to gain peace in any fashion. The question is, why is it so many Christians have a lack, L-A-C-K, of peace? Why is it that so often we as Christians are all distraught and we've lost our tranquility, and we do not have the freedom from that oppressive thought and emotion from within that keeps us uh, in strife and turmoil and keeps us in a sense of wonderment and doubt as to what tomorrow holds. May I suggest that more often than not, it is found in fountainheaded out of the personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We can say, yes, I believe God. Yes, I believe Jesus. Yes, I believe that Jesus Christ is God come in the flesh. Yes, I believe the Bible. Yes, I believe that what God said is correct. But have we placed our faith, our trust, our total confidence in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross? It is through him. He's the access. He's the doorway. He makes the possibility. He is the full potential of peace that passes all understanding. Mark chapter 9 and verse 50. Scripture says, Salt is good, but if salt hath lost its saltiness, wherewith will you season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace one with another. It goes back to the factor that as we have that peace with God, we can have peace with others. Now listen very carefully. I'm not going to stand here and try to tell you that if we have peace with God, we're going to always have peace with everybody. I have found From the human standpoint, that's an impossibility. Regardless of what I do, some folks love me and some folks hate me. (laughs) And that just seems to be the natural fallout of events. There's no riding the fence. Anybody that's known me any length of time, they can tell you. Had a recent conversation with a politician. He's running for the state house. He's seated on the school board now. And uh, he walked into the rotunda, and we had a conversation one afternoon. And uh, during the course of that uh, conversation, I said something about where do you stand on this, and what are you going to do with that, and what do you do with the other? And I said, because if you take a stand otherwise, I don't have any interest in voting for you whatsoever. And he laughed and looked at me, and there were a couple other men present. He said, you don't ever have to wonder where Dr. Youngblood stands, do you? <laughs> The problem is it's often because we take a stand on truth, we take a stand on the Word of God, we take a stand on Scripture and what the Lord Jesus Christ says, there are others that will absolutely have enmity toward us and will not have that allow us to have that peace one with another. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost its saltiness, its savor, it is uh, wherewith shall it be its season. Have salt in yourselves. We're to be salt and light. Have peace one with another. It's an impossibility to be at peace with others if we're not at peace with God. It's an impossibility. So many homes today are in strife and turmoil. So many homes today are broken and do not have peace. And it's simply because of the rudimentary fundamental cause that there is not peace in the heart with the Lord Jesus Christ. Mothers and daughters are at war with each other in so many homes. Fathers and sons are in battle one with another in our homes because of a lack of peace with God. Peace with God is the avenue, the access by which we can have peace with others. So we see not only the supply, we're talking about the security of peace reviewed. Not only the supply, but also the spread. Peace is spread from one to another, impacting lives 
for eternity. And that is not possible unless we have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. What is the secret? And I close. We see the security of peace reviewed. We see the supply. We see the spread. But I want us to understand the secret. In Romans, the eighth chapter, in the sixth verse, we read these words. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. What does it mean to be spiritually minded? What does it mean? Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things of good report, the Apostle Paul says, think on these things. It is a matter of having a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, and then the fruit of the Spirit is part of that fruit of the Spirit is peace. In Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faith fruit of the Spirit. If we have the Holy Spirit residing in us, the fruit that is born in our lives will include love, joy. That word love there is the word agape. It's the God kind of love. Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faith. The question is, do we have that peace that God would have us to have as related to Jesus Christ. Psalms 119, verse 165. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend. It's the word scandalon. Nothing shall offend, scandalon, cause to stumble and fall. Listen to that verse again. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall cause them to stumble and fall. Now, that's a powerful statement. That's a powerful verse. May I remind us, the love of God through Jesus Christ, the doorway to salvation, and that supernatural, special, stabilizing supply of peace that will be in our lives that can spread to the lives of others. And the very secret to that is loving the Word, loving the Lord. My question is, when you have a time of strife, 